Welcome back to Kevin Pollock's Chat Show. I am, as always, Chat Show. How the hell are you? And thank you for giving a damn. Uh, continue to write to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. I love reading your emails. I went through several today to read for today's show. And um, <laughs> there are too many good ones. That's my excuse. No, I um, have limited time today, so I want to spend it, all of it with our guest. Um because I have a twofer. I'm recording two shows today. So I'm going to read the email in the second show because I feel it's – it's. Uh, I, I had less time to prepare of the two shows that I'm doing today. So I'll, I'll kill some time by reading your emails. How's that for enthusiasm and uh, and a way to provoke you to, to write? For those of you who give a good goddamn about The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, uh, the show that I'm on on the Amazon Prime Network um, – since we spoke last, the show won eight Emmys, including Best Writing, Best Director, Best Supporting Actress, Best, best Lead Actress, and Best Comedy. It was crazy. Uh, we had already won three of what they call the Emmy Technical Awards, which included Best Casting in a Comedy. So I felt like I'd already personally won an Emmy, being a part of the cast. Uh, but that was from the technical portion of the Emmys. The non-televised, really. So as far as the big... The Big Boy bot Broadcast, Jamie and I had not been to the Emmys before. I, I haven't done that much TV, in the, and what I've done, no one gave a shit. So this is first time at the Academy of the Television Arts and Sciences, and it's really treated like an Academy thing. Uh, it's a little too fucking serious uh, for, my, for my enjoyment, but it was exciting. First time for anything is exciting, damn it. Uh... So when every – each time the show won an Emmy, which was five that night, Jamie and I sort of stood up like we had just won the, the World Series or the Super Bowl. I mean it was crazy. Fists in the air like lunatics. <laughs> and people are in gowns and I'm in a tuxedo. <laughs> but we were in a little section of uh, Maisel people, so we all sort of lost our mind. But by the time we went up for the best comedy, the final – second to last event of the night, award of the night um, – which is the only one I was allowed to join on stage. Uh, if you win Best Show, they allow everyone who's ever worked on the show in any capacity to come on stage who happens to be in the room. Um, so, you know, I stand next to the craft service guy. But uh, I, I did end up standing next to Tony Shalhoub, and there was a wide shot of us, because I watched it later, where you do see me say something to him while Dan Palladino's giving the acceptance speech. In the back of him, I'm, I say something to Tony Shalhoub, but he starts laughing. So I thought I would tell you what I said to him. Uh, I said, it's official, Tony. You're the only one of us who lost an award tonight because we won five out of six. And he laughed so fucking hard. But he loved that um, Henry Winkler won in the same category. And Henry was so great. And it began his acceptance speech by saying, I wrote this speech 43 years ago. So everyone was thrilled at Henry won. On top of which, he's brilliant in the HBO series Barry. He really is astonishing in that part, uh, as opposed to one of those career awards. It really was earned. Plus, Tony's got a couple, you know, really. It's enough already. But as we, the other thing that was palpable on that stage was that the audience, for the most part, had had enough of Maisel. <laughs> and you could feel it, man. Uh, not just from the people who were nominated and didn't win. You could feel it from the entire audience. It was like, these fucking people again? Uh, I guess at the Academy Awards, for movies, they spread things around. So if you win Best Screenplay, you know you're not going to win Best Film kind of thing. It rarely is a sweep. Best Director doesn't always go to the Best Film. But in television, I guess they liked the sweep, and that's what happened, and people hated us. So I had a hell of a good time. I'll tell you that right now, and I'll tell you the rest later. Season two drops. Uh, I guess I can just say before the end of the year. I'm not. They they have a date in mind, and I'm uh, legally obligated not to share it with you. Yeah, it's bullshit. <laughs> um, folks, uh, I'm just going to get to it. You've heard me rant on this show about my favorite show. No, not the Maisel program. Uh, while I was instantly hooked on the Maisel program as a fan, too, my number one favorite since it dropped uh, now almost two years ago, also on Amazon Prime, is called Patriot. Uh, I've been pretty much uh, ranting about it nonstop on this show and also just in life to, to people. You know, because there's almost 500 scripted shows, some say more. 
Uh, and just the, just to break through and get anyone to talk about whatever it is you're working on, it, it has become the new impossible. Um, so while I was thrilled that the Maisel tapped into the alleged zeitgeist, I, I became more and more upset that my favorite show, Patriot, had not. And so I, I've been uh, running around to the neighbor's house first, knocking on their doors. Um, but like, you know, real – Big time, big pants show business. Jim, James L. Brooks, I've mentioned too many times, plays often in my weekly poker game. And so, you know, at the poker game, you're with your pals you're six, seven hours once a week and you're shooting the shit. And, you're, and everyone's talking about what movies that just came out that they saw or what TV shows. So I started yapping to pay, about Patriot to them. And I mentioned it to James L. He said, what's this? So I said, J just, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Just dial it up on the Amazon Prime. And he played the next time. It was a couple weeks later, and he came, and he said, "Kevin, it's the best hour of television I've seen in 25 years." This is a man with 20 Emmys, maybe more. Uh, created the Mary Tyler Moore Show, Taxi, so on and so forth. Forget all the Academy Awards and the, the movie maker. Just so when he says it's the best television I've seen in over 25 years, I finally felt vindicated. Um, and now I'm reaching out to the neighboring towns around my own. I'm eventually going to canvas the, the United States of America and then go out to the rest of the world <laughs> because Amazon Prime is available all over the planet. Show's called Patriot. My guest today is one of the main reasons it's the best hour of television, bar none. Uh, please welcome the now historically talented Kurtwood Smith, <laughs> if that is your real name. That is indeed my real name. Right. Did Kurtwood start as the first name always, or was it the middle name? It was always Kurtwood. Uh, my mother and, well, my family always called me Kurt. That's what she wanted to call me, but okay. she thought it was too short for to go with Smith. Right. Kurt Smith? Yeah. Sounds like a baseball player. Mm, and a musician. I yeah. Believe. Yeah. But, uh, so she just she wins the wood on there. You know? I think it's great. Yeah. How many other Kurtwoods have you run into? None. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You can't you can't compete with that. Yeah. Uh, now, why? What made mom so damn smart? That's funny. That's an interesting question. She was just kind of an interesting gal. Yeah, mom. Yeah. yeah. This was that you were born in Wisconsin. Born in Wisconsin. New Lisbon. Yeah. Uh, but according to the internet, you you actually grew up in the San Fernando Valley. Yeah, pretty much. I was from from when I was ten to when I was seventeen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then I. After I graduated from high school, Canoga Park High School, yeah, um, home of television stars. I think Brian Cranston went there. That's right. Kevin Spacey. And sure. Just, yeah. Um, I went you and north I to go to school. You and I shared a university, San Jose State. You went to state? I did. Ah, yeah. A long time after me, but yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I'll, here's the more important part. I graduated in nine months. My friends call it dropping out, but I felt as if I'd had enough. <laughs> Whereas you not only completed, you went on to Stanford for your master's. Right. What right. the hell? What the Let's hell? Let's get back to mom for a moment, though, okay. back in uh, Lisbon. Because I'm interested very much so in uh, the, the whole point of this damn thing is uh, the, so how did the hell did you get from there to here? Because each one of our stories is ridiculous and unique. So I'm I'm very curious how the hell you got from there to here. So let's go back to Lisbon. Yeah. What kind of kid are you from zero to ten? I was just, uh, I don't know what kind of kid I was. Just kind of a nice little kid, I okay. think, for the most part. Right. Not a I, troublemaker. I wasn't not a troublemaker then. Sure. I waited till I was in my teen years. Good, uh, good move. Um, but uh, at that time, I was just kind of a good kid. Tried to stay alive, uh, you know, in Wisconsin winters. And, um, oh, boy. You, you know, I spent a lot of time on the farm. I had uh, a, a couple of uncles that had farms and cousins. And so wow. on the weekends, I got on the school bus with them and... Went to the farm and spent a lot of time out there in summers and stuff. Everything. What's happening on the farm? Everything happens on the farm, man. <laughs> That's why it's on the farm, especially when your cousins are girl cousins, you know. Uh, I see what you're uh -huh. saying. So not just the wild, uh, the, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. yeah. I, I had a couple of male cousins, too, in a different family. but um, So we would all get together and we'd just run like a bunch of crazy savages, you know. Through oh, the, a working uh, farm? Yeah, yeah. What, uh, are they, what, what are the farmers producing? Milk, milk mainly, but right. uh, it was Wisconsin dairy farm. But uh, sure. they also had pigs and chickens and all that stuff. And you know, did horses. you you were put to work as well, or just run? Oh around? yeah, yeah, yeah. You had chores. You had to do stuff. You know, I remember. I remember when I was like that age, having to help. You know, when they were like, you know, bringing in hay and stuff like that, and getting that crap all over you. you sure. Oh, uh, at summer. age seven, yeah, eight, nine. Yeah, yeah. I remember having to hold, help hold down. 
pigs while they were uh, castrated. Sure. That's when you're eight years old, listening to those pigs scream. That's an eye-opener. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And how are you with pets as an adult? I don't have any pets. Uh, never did? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. No, we had a cat for 18 years, and that was great. We travel too much. Right. I, I feel, you know, I mean, you can get people to come over and stay at your house, but it's— Yeah. I just—we don't feel right about having sure. pets, actually. Yeah, well, We yeah. like them, but— But you went ahead and raised some kids— Raise some kids. I have to say that my ex-wife, my first wife, she did most of the raising. Okay. I didn't really get a hold of them until they were pretty much – I would see them all the time, but – Right. Uh, after they were in college, then they came down to L.A. And then so – Oh, that's Now cool. they're mine. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're, uh, you're holding down a pig at age seven or eight. <laughs> You know, that, that does forge a great many things yeah. in a heartbeat. Yeah. I, I, we're cat people, and uh, I am, I find, a bleeding heart uh, pansy when it comes to this cat's uh, health. Mm -hmm. That um, I kind of lose my shit to the point where I can't even put her in the crate and put it in the car because the sound that the cat makes. Oh, is uh, yeah, yeah. It's not. It can't compete with a, a pig losing its nuts. But I tell you, <laughs> it, having not experienced that, I would assimilate. Well, uh, the cat is also your personal friend. It's you know. That's I right. You didn't really have yeah, a bond with that particular yeah, the, the pig, and I were not close. <laughs> the pig didn't have a know? name. No, <laughs> no, the pig didn't have a name or a personality, <laughs> and, or, or testicles. Right, and no longer. <laughs> um, so so yeah. So now I found. Uh, in Los Angeles, if you pay just a little couple hundred bucks, uh, they'll come to your house. The vets. The vet will? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a great one. I'm just going to say I'm 911 vet. That guy's amazing. The whole company's great. Oh, that's um, good if you're know. a pansy like me and you can't put the animal in the car and get it down to the yeah. vet, which I can and have, but once I had, look, look, I've said it before. Money is to buy convenience. If you have a little money, Buy yourself some convenience where it really matters. And this cat's health, again, makes me turn into such an idiot. I um, hear that. So, so you get out. You, you ever had to feed your cat through a tube? Not enjoyable? Not enjoyable. Yeah. 18 years you said you had yours. That's mm -hmm. a hell of a run. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, see? And he was always getting hurt somehow. But, yeah, well, uh, the male cat, yeah. they'll give you a little more trouble. Yep. He was always getting those big abscesses from getting in fights. And sure. And he'd have something else wrong with him, and we'd be feeding him through a tube. And you yeah, know, joy, just a joy. Yeah, uh, it sounds like an outdoor cat if he's getting in fights. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, he was. Yeah, he was up to his last few years, and it was like no, 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 no. Yeah, he's he's, he's not going to win. He's not winning any of these fights. <laughs> <laughs> if you're getting your ass kicked, come on inside. <laughs> right. Yeah, let that be a lesson to all you out there. If you're getting your ass kicked, come on inside. Uh, so. Uh, what brought the family to the San Fernando Valley from Wisconsin? Because that's a hell of a shift. Yeah, well, you know, um, my folks, um, they both went to high school. Well, actually, it was my mom and my stepdad. They All right. had gone to school together. My, my mother had married uh, a young uh, soldier from uh, Louisiana uh, at the beginning of World War II. Um, that's where I came from. And um, he was killed, um, you know, about a month before the end of the war. He was Holy a pilot. cow. Plane went down and um, got all kinds of medals and things. But, oh, yeah. Uh, he never saw me. I never saw him. Uh, but I would. But I spent a lot of time in Louisiana because of it, which was another really interesting thing to go through when you're a kid. You know? Did you trace his life or his upbringing? Or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he... He and all his, he was one of seven. He was the youngest of seven. They were all born in Texas, Carthage. And when my grandfather, who was like a local sheriff or whatever it was, he died of a heart attack in his 40s. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother, Nita B. Smith, took those seven kids, didn't figure it out. She was in Carthage, Texas, thought she'd have a better chance in a bigger city. So she took seven kids. Wow. And dragged them all to Shreveport, Louisiana, raised them all by herself. Can't even fathom that. If I had to go to yep. the dry cleaners in the bank in the same day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Seven kids Seven to Shreveport. Kids. Yep, yep. And they all grew up to be pretty good kids. Yeah. yeah. That's astonishing. Yeah. One yeah, of them true. being your father who gave his life in World War II. That's right. Um, That's right. 
so you eventually uh, d- discovered as much as you could about him and the family. I did, yeah. but also I spent uh, 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 not only did I discover a lot about him, which was interesting. You, you, you never really discover because by the time you get old enough to say, "Well, what was he really like?" and this and that, all your uncles and aunts have been without him for fifty years, and right. you know. What well, can uh, I tell you? He was in his twenties, yeah, right? He right. was 22 years old. Oh, tw- God. Maybe he was 20, 22, 24 years old. Um, I know. It's just amazing to think about. It, it is truly amazing, yeah. uh, honestly. Just to be a pilot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and to lead the, this final assault on the Operation Varsity. Um, he was in the uh, lead plane with the commander of the division, and, uh, and the plane got uh, hit with flak. And sure. They, they were dropping paratroopers, and they got rid of the paratroopers, and it was too late for them to get out. Like so many. That happened, yeah. Like yeah. so many. Uh, but, so uh, you're raised by thing, your stepdad and your mom. My stepdad and my mom, who had gone to high school together, a little tiny town. Oh, great. But before we leave Wisconsin, you know, it was interesting to go from this little town, New Lisbon, because now we're talking about 50s, to Shreveport, Louisiana. Ah. Really different world. Sure. You know? I was kind of identified with that <clears throat> Randy Newman song, um, uh, Dixie Flyer. Uh huh. About when he's, it's about going from L.A. Sure. to to uh, New Orleans during the um, during the war. But right. anyway, um, yeah, because it was a whole different world and one that I, I I wasn't really aware was going on until you get down there and it's like this is you know whites only you know college what's the, what's the deal here you know yeah and some people are their own parents in that neck of the woods mm-hmm. yeah. There's a little bit of that. Yeah. Uh, it is a different planet. Well, it's certainly, yeah, much more so then than I think now. You know, now the world's a lot smaller than it was then. Um, you know what's going on in the world now pretty much, especially in the United States. But, you know, if you're a kid in New Lisbon in the, you know, late 40s, 50s, what, what do you know about Louisiana and, you know, and... Uh, what's going on with uh, racial issues. Sure. Uh, you know, you just, that's just not something that's on your... And also to see it up close, the way you saw that pig. <laughs> well, in uh, terms of uh, <laughs> shock value. Shock value. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And how, what years were you... Because I loved all those people in Louisiana. Right. You know, and yet they were living a different world than I was. Yeah, they were raised yeah. with a different mm-hmm. set of concerns and beliefs. That's right. How long did you stay there before we got to the San Fernando Valley? Uh, I was ten years in uh, in, in uh, Wisconsin, and then we uh, then we went to the valley, and uh, just uh, that was another world too. Right? Uh, you know, um, I mean, the town I lived in in Wisconsin had twelve hundred do- people, uh, and then all of a sudden I was in Los Angeles, uh, you know, three blocks from the MGM studio. At Is first. that? You know, at first. At first. While the, our little our little house in Canoga Park was being built. So that was GI like Bill. Culver City? Culver City, exactly. Yeah. 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 Right in the Sautel, Sepulveda area. Right. Um, so uh, what, what was so the work was that adjustment. brought the hmm? folk? What was the work that brought oh, the folk? Oh, um, that was it. There wasn't really any work. And, uh, you know, they were bored living in little town, Wisconsin. Um, right. And uh, my uncle, my, my stepdad's brother, was out here and said, you guys got to come out here. And so they did. Plenty of work. They did. You know, it was like they just, packed he up. quit his job. They packed up in their, you know, uh, 49 Ford. Sure. And the five of us just came across country. To, no job, no nothing. Holy cow. Yeah. No, just showed up and. And at that age, you'd not seen much outside Lisbon, I'm guessing. Just uh, um, uh, New Lisbon and a couple of trips to Milwaukee and then, of course, Shreveport. Right. Yeah. But when you're driving across the country. Oh, wow. Wow. And it just goes on for days. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> right. you know, I thought it would be like going to the farm or something, you know, in a different direction. But no, no, it was days and days and staying in little motels and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It was, it was great. I... Um, uh, and then it wasn't when we, but it was, it was fine. It was funny. It was fine when I was coming out here from, from, uh, no Lisbon all the way across the country. But when we were living in 
Culver City, and they were building the house in Canoga Park. There was no 405 that went to the valley. You had to take Sepulveda. Uh-oh. So whenever we would go out there, so I developed motion sickness. Oh, wow. Yes, yeah. So the next time we went to Wisconsin, they gave me too many drama, mean, and I started Slap. talking to people that weren't there, <laughs> which kind of freaked my mother out. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, bet it did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Who are you talking to? Kenny? <laughs> Kenny? <laughs> <laughs> Not one of your brothers? How many? How many of those pills did you give him? Four. <laughs> Four? He says to give two. Him two. <laughs> anyway, wow. Or one or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, holy crap. So, so but uh, I, 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 I loved uh, growing up in the valley. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was great fun. Well, now, once you get into to that those teen years, mm. and you said you you eluded earlier that you weren't a troublemaker maybe till. Well, you know, we used to do things like there were uh, there was a street full of us because that's what you everybody did. Everybody was the same age, it seemed like you know. So they're, they're, everybody in the neighborhood was like my age or a year older, and uh, so we just ran. And in those days. You know, you didn't have play dates, you know. Nope. You just got up and then you went and yeah. you were supposed to be home by dark or whatever. And, yeah. And um, I've talked about on the show how <laughs> my I'm curious now looking back and trying to remember. Because I sort of ran with a similar pack in, in the suburbs uh, of Northern California. Oh, where, yeah, where about San Jose. Well, there was an oh, or- oh, oh, orchard oh, okay. at the end of the street. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. born in San Francisco and raised in San Jose. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, the curfew when you you're running around with your friends on your bikes or what have you and uh i was trying to remember later when we were driving around in cars without cell phones how the hell did we know where each other was going to be because so, there were certain places you went <laughs> yeah there was like three or four places yeah. you'd go but if the, if you didn't find your friends there yeah those those were some lonely hours yeah. trying to figure out where is the world <laughs> how did the world get on without me but Why for the didn't most they part tell me yeah or you'd run into somebody at a gas station. Hey, do you know where? Uh, yeah, yeah, they're all yeah. at the party out at Johnson's. <laughs> party at Johnson's. Uh, <laughs> well, so well, you're we running around with a pack. Right away, uh, fairly fairly early into my teen years, we discovered how much fun it was to shoplift things. Oh, you betcha. And so we would do that, and then we would take it a step further, which was, okay, you three go to Reseda, and we will go to. Cronoga Park, and we'll see who can steal the most. And so you would steal all this crap. You Useless. Know, stuff that you didn't want, just yeah. that was easy to steal. It's not and about what you're going to do with it. No, it's about the the high. It's about the rush. Of sure. Stealing. And now you also created a competition. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then that sort of carries on, and the next thing you know, Sullivan is really good at hot wiring cars. Ah, that's that's helpful. Yeah. And he had an older brother that showed him, maybe. <laughs> no, no, he didn't. He was, he was an only child. He learned from some, you know, these guys, these even older guys who sat around in the garage all day right. of their house, you know. Anyway, the next thing we knew, we were uh, riding around in stolen cars, which, again, it was, you just take them for joy rides and leave them. Something to do. Yeah. And then we, one day we found an ice cream truck. Oh, he took the ice cream truck. Now, that's a move. How old are you at this, this point? This is great. This is uh, like 14, 15. Sure, sure. No one's and even got a brother, license. My little brother reminds me of this all the time. We <laughs> took this ice cream truck. We drove it around. They're pretty boring. They don't go very fast. and you know. Was it filled with ice cream? Yeah. So what we did was we, pulled, we took it into an empty field. And yeah, then we did. went and got all the little kids in the neighborhood, took them out there, handed out free ice cream. But don't you tell. Right. You know? And they didn't. And we what? just left the ice cream truck there, and that was that. <laughs> that was that. That was that. An unsolved mystery. Yeah. But then one of us got busted bad for uh, shoplifting, and then that kind of going all went, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. So that end of that. Oh, man. And at what point are you drifting anywhere near the performing arts? Uh, when I was in high school, when I got cut from the basketball team, they had to put you – in a different PE class because if you were if you were on one of the sports you were in sixth period PE, so they they switched me to sixth period speech. Uh huh. 
which turned out to be the the competitive speech. It's where the debaters were, yeah. people who did oral and terp. And so in order to stay in there, and I knew some of the kids, and they were kind of fun guys. So I thought, yeah, I'll stay here. And so I had to find something to do. So I did oral interpretation. And then uh, I was also pretty good at, like, being a narrator, you know. So I would narrate the assemblies, you know, when the glee oh, club and the— Fantastic. When they came out and did things, I was the guy who would read, you know— and this spring, and in springtime, you know, it's the uh, rah, rah, rah. Uh-huh. and then the and they would sing a few songs. Right. So. Well, listen. Even in the on the internet, one of the things that's noted was your authoritative tone. <laughs> yeah. I so guess. you developed that early, yeah. but but uh, when you uh, eventually get to San Jose State University, which by the way is nowhere near Canoga Park, those of you who are, who are geographically <laughs> challenged. What? Because I grew up in San Jose, so going to San Jose University was just a way of um, not knowing what the hell I was going to do, even though I did know what I was going to do. Uh, I'd already started performing stand-up comedy in, yeah? in uh, music halls. And, really? In high school and stuff? Like yeah, yeah. Well, I started performing when I was 10, uh, lip-syncing the first comedy album of uh, who we now know to be the no longer the most successful serial rapist in history now that he's going to do a little time. But I wish they'd put on the liner notes uh, Bill Cosby's albums. Uh, yeah, you know, you got to take the pills and you, uh, you got to be asleep before we have sex. I'd, I'd like you to be drowsy. Sorry, it's nothing funny about it. So um, well, I wish they'd put that in the liner notes. I wouldn't have worked yeah. so hard at studying his comedy albums. So that was my act when I was 10. So by the time I was a senior in high school, I stopped doing the album bit and started writing my own material. I was doing impersonations. Yeah. So Best Christopher Walken going. Well, you're so very kind to even know of that. Yes. Um, it certainly comes and I heard like this that. great story about Christopher Walken. What, 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 he, Please. He tricked you into coming to some place and then – Said, um, uh, you know, I invited you, and then he told everybody else to hide. And you know, th- this is not true. <laughs> I wish it were true. This is not true. I love this story. <laughs> oh, told everybody to hide. My friend Tony from Chicago told me this. Uh, that it happened to me. True. Kevin Pollock, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. That, oh, that's that funny. Christopher Walken was so enamored of your, imp- or so impressed with your uh-huh. impression of him that. He invited you to some event. Said, oh, Holy this is cow. Great. This is great. This isn't true. I love uh, I love stories you, like this. You came to the event. <laughs> right. Right. And thinking, you know, this is gonna be a great. thing. And there's nobody there. No one except there. Except for Christopher Wall. <laughs> who says, Oh, I can't do it. Christopher Wall <laughs> says, Hello, Kevin. And uh, you know, and you're like, hey, hi. Uh, Where is everybody? <laughs> exactly. Where is everybody? And he goes, Oh, this is just you and me. You know, and <laughs> I love urban legends. Yeah. That's a great one. And maybe it happened to Kevin Spacey, who did a famous Christopher Walken oh, uh, before he was run out of town on a rail as well. <laughs> um, for a different reason. For yeah. Uh, so so I was going to San Jose State University because I was not that interested in school. I was pretty bored. Uh, occasionally, I'd have a teacher who was inspiring. Mm. Or entertaining, mm-hmm. and um, that would interest me. Or, or the uh, English lit teacher in my senior year in high school just taught the the writings of Samuel Clemens before Mark Twain. Hmm. Um, so I really dived face first into the subtleties of sarcasm and cynicism and political humor. This is from high school. This was from my senior year in high school. So that that what a teacher. was a single shining moment. Yeah. And the rest of it, if the teachers were bored, I, were, I was bored. And that was right. pretty much – so I went to San Jose State University. I don't even remember taking my SATs. I don't remember applying. I don't remember did you someone walk, pay for this? The state university you don't pay for? I don't even remember. A couple hundred bucks. Yeah. yeah. So I remember work, I went there. I joined a fraternity because I had a friend said, if you want to meet chicks, you got to join this fraternity. Ah. <laughs> and I worked at the very first Togo's Sandwich Shop, which was right across the street from San Jose State University in 1976. Wait, it was across the street from the drama department? That, uh, that sandwich shop? I, it, but, I don't know if it was. Well, it, it wasn't a Togo's then, but right. there was a sandwich place across the street. That's amazing if it was. Yeah. Um, so those are my memories. But then also just – it felt like high school with ashtrays because I had no <laughs> scholastic uh, goals mm. or interests. And I couldn't wait to get out. So dropping out to take stand-up comedy on full-time 
was my master's class. Mm -hmm. Whereas you gave your life, I'm, I'm assuming, not just to the girls and the parties, but also to the theater, the drama department. Not the first year. Not oh, Well, no one does the first year. Yeah, the first year I was not even a theater major. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just basically wanted to get out of the house, go someplace. I was in Canoga Park. Yeah. So um, – How does San Jose State say, even come up on the map? It's, uh, it's a state university. Yep. So it's pretty cheap. Sure. Um, and um, uh, has a reputation for being a fun place to go. Sure. And – so I was kind of between San Diego State, San Jose State. Yeah, good and choice. I ended up going to San, Diego, uh, San Jose uh, and, you know, pretty much majored in parties. Yeah, you yeah. Know. I, I too was in a fraternity for about a month. Yeah. It, and then I was like, what? This is, you know. <laughs> Do you remember on. which one? I don't think it was SAE. Maybe it was. It might have been SAE. Alpha, That's the one I joined. Really? Yeah. Do you remember the secret handshake? No, I, don't. I think they were all the same. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> Locking pinkies. I think so too. I just remember just it was just all the bullshit. Yeah, of, it really you know, was. Of being a pledge. I thought, oh man. Yeah, I don't need I, this. I was supposed to, you know, before you can come upstairs, you've got to say that Mr. So and so is this terrific guy. And they said, Mr. So and so is a cocksucker. <laughs> and it was like silence throughout the entire house. <laughs> Then I had to go and talk to the president of the fraternity. Yeah, and we understand you. you I just uh, said, no, I'm out of here, man. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know. yeah. So the first year, you didn't really know what you wanted to do. And how did you drift towards the drama department? Um, I took an acting class. Yeah. Because I, I thought, well, you know, I did that speech thing in school. Enjoyed that. Let's see. So I took an acting class. I did a, my first scene was a scene from Golden Boy. You know the play? No. Golden Boy. He's a fighter. Sure. You know. Okay, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they they did it. They had a couple of movies of it. Uh, anyway, so um, so uh, Clifford Odets. Right. Uh, I did this, and I went. Oh, I can do this easy. And everybody in the class said, "You can do this." And That's the teacher all you said, "Hey, you can do this." And that was that. Yeah. And then I flunked out. But um, flunked out of everything else. I, I got a yeah, but I got an A in that class. That's right. Uh, and uh, then when I was going to, I had to go to junior college. Well, junior college, community college. That's early. right. And um, I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll major in theater and see how that goes. And right. That was that. It was just like, boom, this is this is what I was meant to do. You know? But you have to get some sort of grades in your other classes in order to uh, – uh... Yeah. Well, once I had something I wanted to do, once I had that thing – Right, you know, then it's like okay, now it means I got to take the, do the history, got to do this and then that, and I got to take the time to study, and I can't go out and screw around, and I right. can't get drunk every night, right? And you know, and then it was fine. Then I was on the dean's list. So holy god! So clearly, you're all in or you're all out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that discipline probably came from holding down that pig. <laughs> yeah, right. I'd like to I, think. I did not want to end up being that pig. That's yeah. right. <laughs> if I was going to be somebody in that situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so now you're thriving in the theater department. Right. All right, let's put a pin in that moment. And then I came back to San Jose State, anyway, as a theater person. Yes, no, if you must have. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going from community college to Stanford. Uh, no. <laughs> That's not happening. No, no. Um, okay, so... I, I at the outset of our conversation, but I should say this, please. The, just to, to you know, in terms of my development, what really happened there was in the second year of going to community college before I transferred to state. Uh, the drama teacher, one of the drama teachers, said uh, instructors said this friend of mine um, from Oregon. Uh, he's you know, he's a professor down at Santa Clara, and they're starting the Shakespeare Festival. And he just came up and saw the show we were doing. We were doing Othello, and I was playing Othello, 19 years old. Oh my! Uh, and uh, they they want you to come to the Shakespeare Festival. So I said, Yeah, sure. And I did, and that was that. I did that for seven years during the summer. So that was really where I learned more than any place else was that. Holy cow. That Shakespeare, you know, which became the California Shakespeare Festival until it fell apart. <clears throat> right. And uh, according to the internet, that's where your daughter was born, Santa Clara, California. Does that sound right? Uh, she was, well, yeah, I mean, in that area, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, she, Los Gatos, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were living in Los Gatos, but she went to, 
my daughter ended up going to Santa Clara University. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in Los Gatos. Yeah, yeah. That was one of the first restaurants where I went from busboy to waiter to stand-up comedian in the corner. Which, which one? Because they had a musical duo that would perform <laughs> in the corner. And uh, I was a waiter, and I said to the, the manager who I was getting stoned with on our breaks, you know, I'm doing stand-up comedy now, yeah. and uh, when the band takes a break, maybe I could do 10 minutes just to kind of keep the thing going. You don't have to pay me. And he said, sure, yeah, great. The Antique, it was called. Yeah. Old Town, Los Angeles. Yeah, 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 Old Town. Yeah. Well, well that's, that Shakespeare Festival moved to Old Town. Oh, is that and right? We, yeah, we did a, a couple of years at uh, like three, three, year, three, four years in Old Town. Holy cow. And then later it became the California Actors Theater in Old Town. So, yes. Right. Quite familiar with the Antique uh-huh. and, uh, and Old Town and... That's the wine cellar. The wine cellar. Or, better know, believe it. All that stuff. Yeah. Holy cow. The world just got smaller. Yeah. Um, there was a back door from the theater down into the wine cellar. That's exactly right. I, I feel like I did a play at that theater in Los Gatos as well in my youth as like a 13-year-old. Um, Maybe. Yeah. Because yeah. I think that the teacher was going down to the wine cellar on, <laughs> on his breaks. And throwing back a couple. Um, now, at the outset, I I, I talked about uh, my favorite television program. Yeah, so, if you don't mind, we're going to jump from the past to the present. Okay. And um, I need to know a number of things. Uh, first of all, when you read the first script, did the tone that became the visual of the show exist on the page? Yeah, here's the thing. Um my manager called and said, um, there's this show, uh, I don't know, was it called Patriot then? I think it was called The Patriot at that, at that point. Um, and they want to offer you a part, but the, the, the writer, director wants to talk to you first. I said, okay. So he called me, Steve Conrad, and um, said, I just want you to know that, <clears throat> that by, na- by then I had already read the script. And I went, oh, this character's just what I've done, you know, nothing exciting in that first episode. Uh, but what a show, you know! I was just totally captured by the uh, by the script and what was going on. Yeah, your guy's just and, a yeah. tight ass in the first episode. Yeah. And so I thought, well, oh, I, I want to do. I just want to be a part of this. I don't care what I do. But he calls and said. But your character is really going places. I mean, he's really going to change, and different things are going to happen, and all that. And I was—he's like, going to go through something. Yeah, he said he's going on an adventure, and I said, "I'm in." You know, I mean, uh, I said I just love the pilot so much. I mean, the script, right? And uh, yeah, it was all there. It was there. I mean, is it better than it? Yeah, it, it ended up, I think, being even better. Than it read, but it read magical. very much like that. Yeah. To me, it was magical. Yeah. It's so dry and so different, yeah, and so beautifully subversive. Yep. When I try to explain it to people, because most people who don't know anything about it are not that familiar with its creator. Mm. Let me uh, throw you some more water here. Yeah. Um, I tell them, imagine if uh, Soderbergh, Wes Anderson, and the Coen Brothers decided to do a show about espionage. Yep. Or the espionage at the center of it. Um, it's just so uniquely uh, and, and visually uh, compelling. Yeah. And, and and look, sometimes when you feel stress watching drama, it's a good thing. So when I say I felt stress, don't don't take it as a negative. Mm-hmm. It's nearly impossible to to create a fictitious world and make the viewer so involved. That they <laughs> that their reaction is stressful. Yeah, that's an achievement. Yeah, um, I had it yesterday when I went to see a really bizarre little film called The Sisters Brothers with John C. Riley and oh. Joaquin Phoenix, a little western, which looked like it definitely came from a novel, but looked like a pet project maybe of John C. Riley's because he was listed as one of the producers. Um, it is one of those quirky, weird, kind of slow. Western that is compelling all the way through. Wow. And I felt stress throughout parts of it. And I th- w- walked away and I was trying to explain to my better half, Jamie, 
Um, that is such a unique and great part of a, uh, a film going or television going experience when you can actually feel stressful. So I, I, I don't know if it read at times as stressful as it was in the first, not for your character, but for the show itself. I think once once we shot the pilot, um, which we shot where Forgive Montreal, me. Montreal, uh, and then uh, then we shot the rest of the first season in Chicago. A few people who were when their character went to Europe and went outside the hotel were got to go to um, um, Prague for three weeks. Um, the fictitious city is Luxem- Luxembourg. Luxembourg. And then we went to, which is not fictitious, actually. Right, as it but, turns uh, out. Yeah. But, um, but I think it's a different one represented in the show, or it's the same one? I feel like Luxembourg, I think of not outside of Paris. Maybe Luxembourg I'm wrong. Luxembourg is not far from Paris, right. but it's its own little country. Right. Luxembourg is not a city. It's a little country. That's right. A little tiny country. Um, and then we shot the second season in Paris, which which drops in November also. Yeah. Yeah. You said that about your show, which is wonderful. Oh, uh, thanks. Mrs. Maisel. Um, and I, then I th- began to think, can I say that it drops on the n- November 9th or was that a secret? But anyway, <laughs> I think that's when it drops. The tricky thing <laughs> about these shows that drop to be binge-watched mm. When people yell at me about when is the next season yeah. starting, why do I have exactly. to wait so long? Yeah. It's because they end up being little movies. Yeah. Amazon's spending a lot of money on these shows. Mm-hmm. And they're not 48 minutes like a broadcast hour is because of commercial fill. Mm-hmm. And they're often well over an hour. And so they're making these films, uh, in our case, 10. Mm-hmm. 10 well, uh, ten the first season, eight the second season. Second season, okay. So eight films have to be uh, – prepped, shot, yeah. and then post-produced with with music and all that goes into making a film. And then the eight of those films have to be done, and that takes yeah. a very long time. And then not only that, but what happens is that everybody then watches them in about two weeks. Yeah, and they want to know when the, so, what the hell happened. When's the, you know, <laughs> the whereas one? opposed to if you're watching – 22. Spread, yeah, yeah, spread out over 22 weeks, and then it doesn't seem as, as yeah. long till the next one. You start comes working out. in yeah. July, and they start dropping in September. Right. right, right. And you keep making them while they're dropping, and that's the way the model's been forever. Yeah. Since the 50s. But Amazon does have a tendency to hang on to them. This show's been ready since June, you know, and they, they don't want to drop it till November because they have a master plan, which is. The, your show is part of too, I would right. assume. Right, you know? right. So they're they're still finding their way. They're a new venture yeah. in yeah. the world of the uh, – we're now coming up on 70 years of broadcast television. It's amazing though, isn't it? I yes, mean, it is. I mean, it's amazing how much stuff there is today and how the whole business has changed. Yeah. I was talking to an actress the other day that I hadn't seen for a few years. I said, since the last time I saw you, it's a different business. Yeah. You know? Yeah. In the last five years for sure. Yeah. And then the last two years, even more so, and it seems to be um, there's no way to catch up. Yeah. There's no way to watch everything. Sometimes I'll see a billboard for a new show and I'll say, yeah, I don't have time for that. It looks fantastic. <laughs> I don't know when I'm going to watch that. I exactly. just passed the thing across the street. is Netflix. They got a billboard out there for this thing, Maniac. I don't know when the hell I'm going to get to Maniac. Yeah, yeah, it looks yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Right. Can't wait. Yeah, yeah. I said to Jamie, well, we got to watch Maniac. She said, we still <laughs> have to finish. And then she lists the four yeah. shows we're watching. Yeah. So again, how do you break through that conversation? Um, and and so you do the pilot and you shoot the rest of the series in Chicago, which is I think mind numbing to anyone who watched the show because it is set mostly uh, in this world of of Luxembourg, and then a little bit back at the home office, which also doesn't feel like Chicago. So th- th- there are extraordinary actors. This Kiwi at the center of it, Dorman, Michael Dorman, wonderful. Where the hell did he come from? First of all, he looks almost like Brad Pitt. He's a very handsome yeah. fella. Yeah. Uh, born in New Zealand, raised it, I think, I feel like Australia. Australia. Yeah. Uh, did he come from theater? Where the hell did he come uh, from? He's a some st- theater, but, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of working his way uh, through them, you know, doing movies, uh, independent Australian movies, uh, bigger Australian movies. Couple, uh, now I'm spacing out on 
There was a couple of big movies that he was in from that part of the world that. So he's very well known in Australia, or uh, fairly well known. Well known. He's 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 an known. Actor. Yeah. Um, he's a working and actor, and he's a lot more known now. You know, gotta uh, be. I mean, he's he's since we finished, he's done another series. We finished in February. He did a a short film, not a short film, an independent film mm-hmm. that he's the lead in singing as well as as acting. And uh, was he already singing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He yeah. and Terry, they both they didn't sing together before, but they both. Well, I sense, spent a lot of time singing. Yeah, Terry Quinn, yeah. a wonderful actor, also plays his father. Yeah. And um, I felt like he really was a singer in the 60s. Did I make that up? I think so. Yeah. Uh, but he, he, he could have been. Yeah. Right. you know, he... So, so I will tell you the viewing experience is that you instantly fall in love for this troubled, depressed, uh, central character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, who's, who's just... Falling apart, completely from, at falling. At the beginning, apart. the first time you see him, first time you meet him, yeah, in in a park, and yeah, yeah, you know. he's playing guitar and he's yeah. being asked to leave by the local constable. <laughs> uh, but then enter, well, who's going to be the villain in this thing? I'm trying to figure out. And then your character, who who uh, again, you meet him, he's just a tight ass, right? But he really does, as was threatened by the show's creator, Stephen Conrad, mm-hmm. becomes a a central villain, in in a sense, that has nothing to do with espionage, um, <laughs> but just the central character's life. When you think about who, what, what is the greatest conflict in that character's life, it's you. And that doesn't make any fucking sense. Just in terms yeah. of designing a story as a writer, yeah. as a member of the Writers Guild since 1987, I'm here to tell you yeah. that doesn't make any sense. No. <laughs> it's genius on a level that's... Exactly. We're not used to. And also the fact that that guy is ruining my life. <laughs> well, that's what's you know? so funny. Yeah. Because as much of a conflict as your character slowly becomes for <laughs> for him, he is absolutely the main conflict in your life. And we find out later what your life was and where you've gotten to and what an achievement that was to pull your st- character to pull himself out of a pretty bad situation only to be struck down <laughs> by this lame, depressed, seemingly <laughs> worthless human being. I mean, he is a gimp from the moment you meet him in, for your character. Yeah. Just uh, a waste of space. Yeah. And yet right. he keeps thriving despite all the odds. Uh, so, So that – uh, in storytelling, is quite unique and and wonderful. Yeah. In terms of these two characters going at it and at odds, how do how, yeah? So yeah. as you're getting each script for the first season, and yeah, this, then you then because we'd all seen the pilot by the time we started the second, uh, by the time we started the rest of the season, and so then it was very you know it's it. it and then we were shooting episode by episode as opposed to the second season where we shot it all eight episodes at once, like an eight-hour movie. But the first season, we shot episode by episode pretty much. A couple times, we shot maybe two together. Um, So you, first of all, you were, everybody's waiting for the script because they're so jazzed. We were all so jazzed by the show. Sure. uh, They were always waiting to see what happens next week for us as well as the other Where the hell is this going? Yeah. You couldn't have predicted it. No. The female detective character? Yeah. Holy crap. With her little girl, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, and um, <clears throat> so that uh, th- that just feeds into it, then you know, because everybody's uh, everybody's so excited. And you can really, when you read the script, you can just see it, you know, especially Jimmy, uh, um, the uh, photographer. Uh, he's just he, he just does such terrific work. He sure does, know, and works so well with with the actors and. And uh, and the camera operator Jody, you know, it's a really really great uh, team all the way around. Yeah, we, yeah. Everybody just loved to come to work every day. You know, yeah, well, the y- y- I would think so. Yeah, I would think so. Um, also, the um, oddly in shape character who works within the company, who uh, is gets he ha- uh, Dorman has to stab him <laughs> to get him out of the way. Chris, ridiculously yes. in shape. Chris Conrad. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Who's you, the brother of Steve Conrad? Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. 
And so where but did he- But clearly not cast out of nepotism because the guy is great. Chris is great on the show. Yeah, but yeah. also there's this weird Clark Kent thing happening because he's got glasses <laughs> exactly. on. You're thinking he's supposed to come off as a little nebbishy guy, but underneath it, he it has a very structurally up. handsome face to begin with. Yeah. So it's like, who are they kidding with this guy? What's what's? And then the moment comes where he lets everyone know just what kind of shape he's in. And, I, you know, it's as confusing as I've set it up. <laughs> in terms of what the fuck just happened. Um, <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's it's darkly and dr- so dry, the humor. And the shots, when he's, when the main character is sitting in those cement... Uh, <laughs> yeah, right, pipe, yeah. Yeah, pipe, out in the middle of nowhere, uh, adjacent to the company, I'm supposing. Mm-hmm. And this shot is... It seems like kind of a why. The composition is beautiful. He's in the center of it inside this giant cement tubing. And Chris Conrad could be coming at him from one direction. You see him way off in the distance. You enter from stage left. Dude, the whole scene was Chris still approaching. Still approaching. Yeah. That shot alone, it it belongs in the Museum of Modern Broadcasting. Yeah. Because it's a clinic. Yeah. So, yeah, so... Uh, when you're out there working on a show like that and you, you're you getting the scripts, the rest of the world does not know what you're working on. Mm. Um, there, I mean, certainly I had a similar experience on the Maisel show the first season before it, before it drops. Nobody knows what it is you're working on. You just have a sense of, well, this is fucking magical. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's going to give a good do- goddamn, but it's what yeah. we're doing is pretty weird and wonderful. Yeah, and it's what you want to do. It's why you got in. Right? It's why you got in the business. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I feel like, uh, in your case, and I, f- I feel it for myself, so I'm curious if you feel it. When you do work at that level, there f- it feels like a second or third act of one's life. It's so potent. Mm-hmm. In terms of, as you just said, realizing why you got into this to begin mm-hmm. with, there's a, you know, while being gainfully employed all these years, as we yeah. have, every now and then you step in something that is of a different ilk. Terry O'Quinn and I, I went to my wife and I went to Chicago to see him. Uh, he he and his lady live in Virginia, and they were doing something in Chicago, so we went to Chicago to meet them. And, just to kind of hang out for a week. Um, they were doing something at an improv theater there. And uh, <clears throat> so we had m- multiple dinners o- over the week. And, it, you know, people ask, and people ask you, um, I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, what kind of role would you like to do? You get to do this, what would you like to do? And I'm always like, uh, <sighs> yeah. And Terry was saying he's the same way. And the way he put it is, what I want to do is scripts like what Steve Conrad writes. Yeah. You know, that's, it's like the, whatever the character is going to be, is going to be interesting if it's done by an exceptional writer. Yeah. You know, I, it always does starts I, on the page yeah. and that's what we always say. Right. Um, and to make that, you've just made that point a, yeah. a little, but it goes right back to the beginning because it's like when you're, when you're a kid and you start doing, and you discover Shakespeare, it's like, Holy shit! You know right. this is fantastic. You know this is exciting and wonderful to do. And then you know, uh, and then you go on, and then you do a bunch of schlocky stuff here and there throughout your life. You know, and, and then you're making money, and you know people recognize you, and that's all fine. But maybe it's whatever. And it's then, not Shakespeare. None of it's, it's Shakespeare. Not Shakespeare. But you know, then you stumble into something like a RoboCop, or and you stumble, and then later on you stumble into something like the '70s Show, and they change your life. That's right. You know, and they change you. As a performer as yeah. well. So that that's really what you want is you want those things that are going to excite you and change you. And, right. Um, and challenge you. And challenge you. Always challenge you. Yeah. Yeah. That's what makes it exciting and right. and wonderful is when it's challenging. Right. And because I, I wanted to get back to when you said about when you first got the script, you said, well, this feels like something I've already done. Um, the character. The character. Yeah. Certainly the character, not the show. So yeah. it was the, the whole of it that excited you, yeah. whereas the character, n- yeah. not necessarily in the pilot. And then Steve explained, exactly. he's going on a journey, 
And as those scripts start to roll out and that journey starts to unfold, you've got to feel like, oh, well, this is something I've never done. Yeah. I've never. And then yeah. we get to another new level of his past, yeah. the character's past. Right. Oh, I see. Yep. I. It's like. I didn't know when we shot the pilot, and um, he sent me, he called me and said, I'm going to send you this, this is for the first, the second episode of the show, what was the first of the regular series when we started shooting, and he called me about a month early, he said, I'm going to send you this scene because I want to shoot this as a one, and, you know, it's 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 kind of tricky for you, and I was like, all right, so I get to say, I'm just like, you know, I have a two-page speech that's gobbledygook. It's truly gobbledygook. Uh, what the, I'm still not sure what the company does, yeah. <laughs> other than you make pipe and fitting. Right. And that's all you need to know. But uh, <laughs> but I thought, holy smolies. You know, and it took a while. Um, you know, you had to memorize it like a Shakespearean speech. She, well, yeah, be, worse, because you had to invent... You had to invent what it meant. How it makes you know, sense. Because it didn't really make sense on right. the page. But for some of us, that is Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> I see. I have to have someone either explain to me what this well, means. Well, that's right. Or I have to make it up for myself. Like in the Folgers edition, when they would be on the other side of the page, you know, on the back page, it would be little things explaining what it the lines meant on the right. other page. Yeah. But you didn't have that with piping and I did and not fitting. have that, no. So that's why it took a little bit longer to learn. But um, – and then at the same time, then he sends me three, and I go, jail? Prison? <laughs> <laughs> wow. But when he – when I read the pilot, and I thought, this guy is so great and yeah. so original and fresh. And when he tells me my character is going on an adventure, I believe him, you know, because I have the proof right here as to what kind of writer he is. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and where did he come from, Steve Gordon? Uh, not Gordon. Conrad. Um, yeah, um, He's uh, written a number of movies. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, one of the more recent ones was with Ben Stiller. The thing about um, uh, it wasn't Walt Mitty. It was uh, I'm, Walter Mitty one? It yeah. was mm-hmm. one. Yeah. yeah. So I remember looking yeah. him up a little bit. I'm yeah. sorry to put you on the spot like that. The truth is, he his writing did not suggest. I don't think that. Uh, no, because he, most of the scripts followed a sort of tradition. Well, even even Walter Mitty, yes, because it comes from the short story, um, you know, f- kind of follows a normal pattern. Um, even some of his earlier films, when you know his writing and you know his dialogue, then you can see it in the earlier films. You can go back and uh, the Weatherman, which is a, yes. a, a kind of loony. Uh, Nick, Nick Cage? Cage movie. Loved it. Uh, yeah, it's great. And that's that's Steve's and uh, some of the other ones. And it was finally when he did a movie and they didn't get it, whoever was directing the movie. That's when St- Steve was like, no more. Right. You know, I'm only doing movies that I have control over. And uh, <clears throat> and they, he and his partner were trying to figure out what to do, whether they're going to go to TV or whether they're going to go to – and, and just focus uh, on features. And um, what made the difference is that the kind of things that they're doing on cable. He said all of a sudden, you know, you do eight, ten episodes. It's like it's like one project. It's like a novel. It's like one thing that you yeah. – one, one big story that you write as opposed to just dragging out 22 episodes every year. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, that's why he – that's why, you know, he, he felt that – it's more creative mm-hmm. uh, to to do. A scripts mostly written ahead of time, or is it? well, or they certainly were when we were in France. Uh, when we did season two, they were all written, all oh. eight episodes. And uh, now, so that allows him to be on set. Yeah, yeah, he directed. Uh, yes, he directed the whole season. The whole season. The second season. Right. First season, he directed. Uh, I want to say a few half of them at yeah. least, uh, but. Uh, you know, they brought in a few people, and uh, uh, Jimmy, uh, the DP, directed one of them. But um, Steve was always there lurking. <clears throat> um, but the second season, yeah, literally, we you would do a you would do uh, within a week. You would do well within a day. You would do scenes from 
the first episode and the sixth episode, and then the next day you'd be doing the eighth episode, and so right. was, you had the whole season in your head as opposed to an episode at a time. Right, which is a different experience. Different experience, yeah. Altogether. Yep, yep. Um, what are you, uh, when I'm asked what am I allowed to tell people about season two of Maisel, I just say, all I can tell you is, first of all, lower your expectations. It's always a good idea. <laughs> um, but then know that we, as a fan of the show, I feel we, we exceeded uh, expectations, which had been raised to an absurd level because, yeah. the, because the, the universe of the show uh, is more ambitious. Is that also true of season two? Do you feel – because <clears throat> to me, I felt the first season was wildly ambitious in terms of its universe. Mm -hmm. uh, so does it expand or is it a contract or both? It expands. It does. It's wild. <laughs> the second season is wild. Well, it's an interesting word to use. Yeah. Uh, descriptive. Uh, wild because it's the, it's the word I would use for season one. Yeah. And it's – you're saying it's all caps and underlined. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's what Steve calls it. Uh-huh. You know, this season's really wild. And uh, <laughs> Oh, my God. Um, it is. You know, and my character just – everything starts right where it left off. Great. But it just takes off. Yeah. I mean, the things that he goes through, that John, the character John Michael Dorman goes through, are amazing. And also Terry, uh, the father. Yeah. And he and I – Building on that relationship that we had at the end of the first season, Terry's character and my character have have a lot more <clears throat> to do together in the second season. Uh, but he goes through some heavy changes, and Mom is brought into the show. Okay, played by Deborah Winger. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, and um, as I say, you know, the whole thing takes place in France uh, with a couple of little. Uh, side trips to Luxembourg. So less duck hunting or more, would you say? Hmm? Less duck hunting or more? Yeah, no duck hunting, but, um, well, there's a flashback to duck hunting. Okay, that's all I need. Yeah, there is definitely because, a flashback because to duck hunting. Because I felt like that sequence, those sequences, mm -hmm. um, that's when I felt the most stress. I thought uh, really bad things are going to happen during, the, <laughs> during duck hunting. There wow. are so many bad things that can happen in this second season. Yeah. Uh, that, well, uh, that's just exciting as hell. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, buddy. And he's got a new show. Who has a new? Steve. Has another show. <clears throat> yep. <clears throat> oh, it's boy. called Our Lady of Perpetual Grace Limited. And Ben Kingsley and- um, It's a limited series. Or limited is no, in the title. It's in the title. Oh, dear Lord. Title. Um, ben Kingsley and uh, Jackie Weaver, uh -huh. an Australian actress, and um, Jimmy Simpson. Sure. Uh, they're, and uh, they're the, <clears throat> kind of the leads. And I think um, – So he didn't feel – Luis Guzman. He didn't feel challenged enough by uh, the work of Patriot. I mean, it really is an astonishing body of work yeah. in itself. He hasn't been picked up for the third season, you know. I mean, he has sure. a positive feeling based on the second season, and and Amazon says lots of positive stuff about the second season. So I'm is. in. There's an executive <clears throat> at Amazon who oversees drama. Mm -hmm. Let's not get into names. Yeah, I think I know who you mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, single syllable first word, yeah. first name, yep. and. Um, uh, he noticed on social media that I wouldn't shut the fuck up about Patreon <laughs> and asked me at one of the Maisel table reads um, if I wanted to participate in the uh, in the push for season two. And I said, oh, I'll do it pretty much anything you'd like me to do because uh, it, it is the greatest show that not enough people know about. Yeah. And, and it has fallen prey to um, there are 500 scripted shows. Yeah. <clears throat> and so – what everything and anything that can be done. So that I, I do know that just from my conversations with him, yeah, that uh, th they are in fact building a campaign because they believe in the show. Yeah. yeah, that's and that's great to hear. Sure, and, and it's great to hear from somebody that's not a not member even involved of our show. in the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, that's what we're hoping for. You know, I think the fact that we kept <clears throat> getting pushed in terms of when it goes on made everybody a little. Mm, What's going on, you know? Right. But we kept hearing that they love it, they love it, they love it. But, you know, so this is great to hear. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, I had worked with one of the actors on the show who was also a producer. Gil. Gil. Yeah. Years ago, mm -hmm. uh, Miami Rhapsody, a um, hmm. uh, little film that David Frankel wrote and directed. He's the one that went on to do Devil mm -hmm. Wears Prada and a bunch of other great things. So I've known him a long time. He's and a I wonderful guy. Yeah. And a, and a wonderful actor. I, you know, and uh, he plays such a stooge of a character on the show. <laughs> just, uh, just horrible. Which he um, plays with such relish. Which he plays so uh, well. Um, but but I, I, I feel like he was a, a big champion for the project for a very long time. Yeah. Um, I ran into him at the um, Television Critics Awards. Mm. Uh, or uh, uh, Critics' Choice Awards. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked a little bit about uh, the importance of um, somehow – Letting the world know about this extraordinary it's gem. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard getting your friends to watch it, you know? That's right. You say, you know, you do everything you can. You say, it's the best thing that I've done. And yeah. Go, wow, it must be great. <laughs> yeah. Please watch it. Oh, man. For yeah. sure I will. Yeah. How's that show going again? What's it called? <laughs> yeah. I meant to watch it. And it's no one's fault. Yeah. Because there's too much. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. Well, listen, uh, whether we have the date exact or not, we, people will know soon enough that season two is coming. And please, if you are within ear uh, reach of my voice and you enjoy entertainment that is uh, head and shoulders above everything else. And again, imagine... Soderbergh, Wes Anderson, and the Coen brothers got together and decided to do a show that's a very dry and dark comedy drama with espionage at the center of it somehow and also a piping company out of – is it <laughs> Milwaukee. Wisconsin? Milwaukee, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, if that doesn't intrigue you enough, uh, it should. Um, now, Kurtwood, we've reached a point in the show uh, called Ask Kevin – where you are allowed to ask me any question. It can be sincere. It can be silly. Um, it can be meaningless or meaningful or none of those. But you are allowed only one question. Uh, only one. Uh -oh. I know. Yeah, Take your time. Is, these aren't, these aren't meant to be easy. Um, I, you know, the pressure is always that you feel like you have to ask something deep. All right. But I, I, I just don't deal with well You don't have to deal, ask something. You know, so. Um, <clears throat> you can ask me about an actual run I had with Christopher Walken. A what? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This I want to hear. <laughs> yes, I do want to hear. So i had been yeah. doing the impression. I've, yeah. I've never told the guests before what question to ask me. No. So mark that down, will you, Sam? Yeah. Um, so i had been doing the impression of him. And I started doing an impression of Christopher Walken pretty early in the now – largeness of it's become pedestrian everyone can do a a a bad christopher walken if they tried uh, too many people try <laughs> there are if you type in this into google search christopher walken impersonation sometime over sixty thousand search answers come up i'm not exaggerating there are five pages on youtube dedicated to asians doing christopher walken oh, and they are fucking hilarious <laughs> uh so speaking of breaking through the noise I am number one on that Google search. Whoa. Now, uh, be that as it may, um, I, I started doing it on talk shows. And I think mm -hmm. that's how people find out about it, clearly. Mm -hmm. Not just because I'm at a party and think I can do it. <laughs> so then I get this call to be one of the two, only two speakers at the ceremony when Christopher Walken gets his hands, feet, and signature in the cement in front of the, what was the Man's Chinese Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. It is a rare... Uh, honoring of any talent it they've run out of real estate is the biggest problem unlike the star in the walk of fame which is a very big deal but you can buy those for like fifteen hundred dollars now yeah um whereas the hands and feet and signature and cement yeah. is an extraordinary yes the other of the only two speakers donald trump doesn't even have nope that. Yeah. and won't uh mm. it, it, the other speaker is uh, quentin tarantino mm. I'd never met Christopher Walken. So I know when they call and ask me to be one of the two speakers, it's because I do this impersonation. But I felt bad for him. This is a very big honor. Shouldn't they have 
people that mean something to him in his life. But that's where I found out that he knew about it, the impression. Because there's, I don't know, 20, 30 members of the press that have gathered to stand in front of this little podium where Quentin Tarantino spoke first. And, you know, it's Quentin Tarantino, so he'll speak till you shoot him in the head. Uh, (laughs) And he had, you know, lovely personal stories to tell, whereas I'm just this idiot monkey who does the voice. So I I owned that. I copped to that. And it was Christopher Walken standing over my shoulder as I'm speaking at this podium. And I I say, well, clearly I'm gathered here to be a part of this because of the impersonation. And then I did – we have Halloween coming up. I did – told a story of how I like to scare the kids when they come to the door. And I, uh, my favorite way is to answer the door as Christopher Walken. Hey, kids. <laughs> Trick or trade. It's a damn good question. Ooh. <laughs> Quite the conundrum. As fate would have it, I too have a question. Which one of you little pricks can guess what I've buried under my house? Hey, kids, where are you going? So... Uh, well, as I'm telling that, doing that bit, it's not even a story because it didn't really happen. I see Christopher walking over my right shoulder, slowly bending at the waist forward in laughter. And there's a little lunch thing afterwards, and that's where I sit next to him and find out that he likes it and knows about it. Yeah. But it's still surreal. Yeah. Because uh, I've also always said, as someone who does impersonations, there's no reason to do it if the actual person's there <laughs> because it's a parlor trick. If I can well, think of someone you like and I can recreate them well enough, yeah. I'll steal the affection you have for the actual person. But if the actual person's standing there, I'm just a monkey doing a voice because yeah. you can't beat the real thing. No, but, but then you would have to write the speech for the real thing. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and much more magical if you imagine ringing the doorbell of Christopher Walken's house on Tricker <laughs> on Halloween instead of me acting that out. Yes. So you see the chasm. Between these two things. And then Jamie and I went to see Christopher Walken in the McDonough play of Behanding in Spokane on Broadway. Huh. And uh, uh, so after – it's great. It was, you know, amazing actors. Um, uh, Sam Rockwell, An- Anthony Mackie, mm. uh, and the actress whose name I always forget, but she's so brilliant. It's just a four-hander. So afterwards, I say, well, let's go up. Jamie, you haven't met him. Maybe we can go to his dressing room and say hello. And um, stage manager, hi, I'm, uh, I guess, a friend of Chris's. Yeah, sure, he's up there. So we go up. There he is. He welcomes us in. We sit down as he sits in front of the makeup and takes his makeup off. And if I hadn't asked a couple of questions, no one would have spoke the entire time we were there. Um, wow. Yeah, which gives you the feeling maybe you weren't welcome to begin with uh, mm. because uh, – Man, this play looks like it's uh, just an incredible thing to be a part of. Yeah. And then back to the makeup. A lot of one-word answers and, um, ve- you know, not not unpleasant uh, or um, uh, uh, seemingly put off by us being there. Just uh, very little to say, <laughs> which left wow. me with, okay, this was maybe mm. as surreal and, and – and, um, as bizarre of, a, of an experience as, as I may not have known I wanted, but in fact <laughs> did. Um, so, yeah, so my world around him has been both of those uh, uh, bizarre uh, things. That's just really Yeah, and then someone sent me a clip of him on, a, on Conan where Conan asked, said, you know, a lot of people impersonate you. Do you have a favorite? And he said, well, Kevin does it great. And then there was a debate online whether it was Kevin Spacey or me. Oh. Um, at any rate, that's the Christopher Walken story. Now. The last part of our show is called uh, Kevin's Pop Quiz. Oops. Yep. I'm going to ask you three questions. Between 5 and 15 points possible for each of these three (laughs) questions. And once the final score is tabulated, it will be posted on our website along with the current standing of the top 100. Are you ready? (laughs) Okay. Here we go. Question number one. Keith David or David Keith? Oh, um, David Keith. That's correct. Question two. Carl Weathers... Or the weather in Carlsbad. <laughs> Carl Weathers. That's also true. Last question, Steve? Conrad. Correct. There it is. <laughs> it's three for three. 
He's in the top 100 immediately. <laughs> um, thank you so very much. Oh, thank you, Kevin. This was fun. Yeah. This was really Just fun. a conversation. Yep. Uh, longtime fan. And, um, thank you. Likewise. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, thanks for sharing uh, uh, with, with, with candor and ease uh, <laughs> as much of your story as I could get out of you today. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, sometime in November, season two of Patriot. Mine. Uh, in the I'm meantime, mine. it might be the ninth. In it the meantime, be. go to Amazon Prime right now. You've already got it just to get the two-day shipping. Yes. And now you've got all this free programming. That's right. So uh, check out season one. Check out season one of Patriot and write to me at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com and I will read your letters and your love and instant infatuation with a show called Patriot on Amazon Prime. Um Kurt Smith, thank you. Thank you. All right. Sam, uh, Thanks, Sam, engineer to the stars. Always a pleasure. Yeah, indeed it is. And all the folks here at Earwolf, thank you for the auspices and this wonderful desk. I guess you're supposed to carve your name or initials somewhere in it with that red uh, Sharpie, okay. Kurtwood. Um, right. uh, yeah, so upcoming guests, let's see. Oh, I Ioni Sky will be uh, uh, the second sh uh, recording today. Yeah. I'm going to welcome her into this room. Um I want to thank Matt and uh, Corey Levin in post and all the folks at Airwolf. Um, I'll try to drag Jamie and Sammy back in here. In the meantime, again, write to us, kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. And until next time, and as always, get out of my face.